After starring at Oberlin College and the University of Michigan, African-American catcher Moses Fleetwood Fleet Walker signed a professional contract in 1883 with the otherwise all-white Toledo entry in the Northwestern League, one of baseball's first minor leagues. Racial tensions were running high that year, and a proposal to prohibit black players from the Northwestern League failed only after a bitter fight. Later that season, Cap Anson brought his Chicago National League team to Toledo for an exhibition game and bluntly demanded that Walker not play. Though he eventually backed down, Anson vowed never again to play against an African American. Just months after capturing the Northwestern League pennant, Toledo was admitted to the American Association, a major league in competition with the National League. Lee Walker made his major league debut on May 1st, 1884. And 10 weeks later, his brother Weldy joined him when the Toledo team endured a rash of injuries. Their union was short-lived, however. Weldy was soon let go, and Fleet played sparingly after suffering a broken rib in July and was released at season's end when the team disbanded. Although the brothers were the sons of a minister and both had pursued higher education, traits that team owners would have found very appealing in a white player, neither was given another chance to play Major League Baseball. Were the Walker brothers major leaguers on merit? The question is a pertinent one, because three major leagues took the field in 1884, the National League, the American Association, and the short-lived Union Association. The additional league meant that many players saw big league action that year, who would not normally have done so. The 19th century statistical record was different enough that it is not a straightforward matter to answer the question of individual merit. And in Weldy's case, there is the additional problem that even his minor league opportunities were very abbreviated. As a result, while Weldy hit well in his limited chances and likely deserved at least a longer look, the sample size is too small to reach any meaningful conclusion. Fleet Walker, however, undoubtedly did belong in the major leagues. He was solid, though by no means spectacular with the bat. But it was on defense that catchers of the era earned their stripes, and that was where Fleet excelled. His Toledo battery mate, Tony Mullane, who won 284 games for seven different major league teams, reported that Walker was the best catcher I ever worked with. But I disliked a Negro, and whenever I had to pitch to him, I used to pitch anything I wanted without looking at his signals. One day, he signaled me for a curve, and I shot a fastball at him. He caught it and walked down to me. He said, I'll catch you without signals, but I won't catch you if you're going to cross me when I give you signals. And all the rest of that season, he caught anything I pitched without knowing what was coming. In addition, like all catchers, Walker exhibited tremendous courage. One of Toledo's bat boys recalled seeing him with his fingers split open and bleeding, but he would go right on catching. He had more nerve and grit than anybody I have ever seen. There can be little doubt that racism brought an end to Fleetwood Walker's major league career. It may also be asked whether this tale still matters more than 70 years after Jackie Robinson brought baseball's segregated era to an end. It does indeed remain emphatically relevant, and here's why. It is comforting to think of slavery and racial segregation as the sins of previous generations of Americans, because it makes it easier to imagine that now we know better and there can be no going back. But it is far more disturbing to be reminded that only a few short years after emancipation, the forces of racism reasserted themselves through the Ku Klux Klan and the Jim Crow laws of the Reconstruction era. Likewise, it is unsettling to be confronted with the reality that baseball's color barrier fell long before Jackie Robinson, only to soon reappear. During the heady years that followed emancipation, Many were confident that African-Americans would soon claim all the privileges of their new freedom. 
This optimism could often be found on the baseball diamond as well. Baseball historians Brian Turner and John Bauman, for instance, report that press accounts in Northampton, Massachusetts, in 1865 and 1866, commended a local first baseman for his heavy hitting and dubbed him Old Bushel Basket for his fielding dexterity. Yet they note those accounts left unmentioned the extraordinary fact that he was an African-American on a white team. Sadly, however, hopes of baseball becoming a vista of racial harmony were soon checked. Until the 1880s, it was rare for white ball players to be as open as Anson about their objections to interracial play. So there often appeared to be few barriers to their participation. Some significant triumphs for African Americans resulted, including the 1875 admission of the Mutual Baseball Club of Washington, D.C. to the National Amateur Association of Baseball Players and the debut of black ball player Bud Fowler in the International Association three years later. But on other occasions, there were telltale signs that the welcome was conditional at best. In an intriguing 1879 instance, the professional career of a mixed race Brown University student named William Edward White mysteriously ended after one National League game. White had been born a slave 19 years earlier in Georgia, the son of a wealthy white plantation owner and one of his African-American slaves. It was very unusual for the paternity of such children to be acknowledged, but this was one of those rare exceptions. William's father never married, and although Georgia law prevented him from marrying William's mother, the signs strongly suggest that he regarded her as his wife. They had three children together, and he sent each of them north to the more tolerant environment of Providence for schooling. After completing boarding school, William White remained in Providence to attend Brown University, where he played first base on the school baseball team as a freshman. His play must have made a good impression, because when injuries sidelined the first baseman of that city's National League team in June of 1879, he filled in for the team's next game. As his college classmates lustily cheered him on from the stands, White handled 12 chances flawlessly, collected a single, stole two bases, and scored a run in a Providence victory. A performance that earned him kudos from the press for his cool and collected demeanor and his expert and effective way of snagging widely thrown balls with great ease. In the aftermath of this auspicious debut, one local newspaper reported that White had been engaged to play first base for the team in their next series. That didn't happen, however. And for reasons that remain a mystery, his professional career ended after that lone game. Under the circumstances, it cannot be assumed that racial prejudice was responsible, but it does look suspiciously as though whispered objections led to that opportunity being quietly withdrawn. If so, it would be consistent with a recurring pattern during these years. Just as surreptitious devices like grandfather clauses and poll taxes were used to prevent African Americans from voting without explicitly prohibiting them from casting their ballots, so too African Americans were often excluded from baseball without anybody having to admit responsibility. A particularly notorious example took place in Philadelphia where an African-American club called the Pythians successfully arranged games against several prominent white opponents, including the city's pioneer club, the Olympics. Following the 1867 season, the Pythians applied for membership in both the Pennsylvania Association of Amateur Baseball Players and the National Association of Baseball Players, only to encounter oblique yet formidable resistance. During the state convention of the Pennsylvania Association, the Pythian's representative, Raymond Burr, was advised by several of his fellow delegates that it would be better to withdraw the application than to have it on record that the club had been blackballed. When he declined to do so, numerous delegates expressed sympathy, 
but only a handful indicated that they intended to support the Pythian's application. As for the remainder, they claimed that in justice to the opinion of the clubs they represented, they would be compelled against their personal feelings to vote against admission. With defeat inevitable, Burr reluctantly withdrew the application. It was a similar story at the National Convention, where the white delegates stood logic on its head to give the appearance that bigotry was not behind the refusal to admit the Pythians. According to one particularly self-serving explanation of the deliberations, granting membership to an African-American club was likely to create some division of feeling, whereas by excluding them, no injury could result to anybody. A decade and a half later, this pattern repeated itself when Fleet Walker signed to play for Toledo. At the 1883 Northwestern League Convention, where a proposal to exclude African Americans was debated, the delegate who had introduced the resolution eventually withdrew it and then requested that all mentions of it be struck from the official minutes. Discrimination, it seemed, was never anybody's fault. The nation's racial climate grew even uglier during the mid-1880s, making open expressions of bigotry more common. At every turn, African Americans found themselves hemmed in by Jim Crow laws, intimidated by the threat of lynching, and essentially abandoned by the federal government and the courts. In the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson case, the Supreme Court legitimized segregation by devising the doctrine of separate but equal. Observed historian Rayford Logan, on the pediment of the separate wing reserved for Negroes were carved exploitation, segregation, disfranchisement, lynching, contempt. This same trend carried over to the sports world. Heavyweight champion John L. Sullivan openly boasted, I will not fight a Negro. I never have and never shall. While other ball players began joining Cap Anson in his overt acts of intolerance. In Syracuse, for example, two minor leaguers declined to pose for an 1887 team picture alongside pitcher Robert Higgins, a black teammate. To the club's credit, the following season, Syracuse brought back Higgins while adding Fleet Walker. The racist insults were compounded by the disappearance of African Americans from Major League rosters. Initially, that absence could be rationalized by pointing to the limited number of African Americans in professional baseball and to the reduced availability of positions after the Union Association folded in 1884. But a duo of talented 20-year-olds, Frank Grant and George Stovey, made their minor league debuts in spectacular fashion in 1886. And when no major league team showed interest in either player, such justifications began to ring hollow. Neither of the major leagues admitted that a color barrier had been created. But as the number of African-American professionals continued to grow and their credentials became more impressive, it became increasingly clear that the big league owners had entered into a so-called gentleman's agreement to keep their teams lily white. In 1888, a white correspondent for the Sporting News maintained that some African-American players were the equal of any white players on the ball field and singled out a barnstorming club called the Cuban Giants as one that could play a favorable game against the best big league teams. Nonetheless, when the Players League mounted a challenge to the two existing major leagues in 1890 and once again created a dire need for talent, no African Americans were given the opportunity to prove their merits. Instead, the tacit color barrier was slowly but surely implemented in the minor leagues, though this too was introduced surreptitiously. After reading in 1888 that one of the minor leagues was planning to rescind its rule, that permitted African Americans to play, Wilde Walker condemned the decision as a disgrace to the present age that casts derision at the laws that say all men are equal. 
Because Walker's reasoning was so compelling and the plight of such players so sympathetic, none of the minor leagues actually adopted rules that prohibited African Americans. Instead, they took the more evasive course of not re-signing them when their contracts expired, while simultaneously leaving the few remaining African Americans in organized baseball subject to mental and physical intimidation. By 1891, with de facto segregation in effect in almost all of the minor leagues, a sporting life correspondent lamented, probably in no other business in America is the color line so firmly drawn as in baseball. An African who attempts to put on a uniform and go in among a lot of white players is taking his life in his hands. Finding themselves so unwelcome, African Americans could easily have lost interest in baseball. Instead, they took to the national pastime with redoubled enthusiasm during the final years of the 19th century, picking up the basics of the game in grammar schools and on sandlots, then honing their skills while playing for military teams, neighborhood teams, college teams, and company teams. In consequence, no sooner were the doors to the white professional leagues closed than there was an unprecedented outpouring of African-American talent. But how would those players display their talents? The first in a series of attempts to create all black professional leagues was made in 1886 but few of them survived for long, if they took the field at all. With no other alternative, most players joined independent traveling teams and became men without a home, endlessly traversing the nation's train depots and dusty roads to get to their next game. African-American teenager Saul White, for example, tore up the Ohio State League in 1887 batting 370, though far younger than most of his competitors. But with the color barrier becoming increasingly rigid, he was not even offered a contract that winter. Rather than representing the end of Saul White's baseball odyssey, however, that was just the start of a 25-year playing career that enabled him to write the first history of black baseball. Today, Saul White is enshrined in the Baseball Hall of Fame. The difficulties of barnstorming could be terribly discouraging. Traveling meant that the indignities inflicted by Jim Crow laws could manifest themselves at any moment, thwarting attempts to address such basic needs as sleep and nourishment. On top of that, there were the vagaries of travel. A black ball player who barnstormed for teams in Kansas in the first decade of the 20th century later recalled we tried to book games all along the railroads. But sometimes there was a little town with a team that had a tremendous following, and we would make that town by any transportation we could get. Sometimes we'd have delivery rigs. Other times we'd have a hay wagon or just a plain dray with boards across to sit on. I've ridden in a wagon 15 or 20 miles and then slept all night in a railroad station to catch a train to get into the next place. We used to carry our clothes in a roll, and whenever we got caught out, we'd unroll that for a pallet to sleep on. By the early 20th century, more than 60 African-American teams were taking to the road on an annual basis. Not only did the players gain experience and refine their skills, the managers of these tours also found ways to streamline the scheduling and travel arrangements in order to ease the hardships of the road. Barnstorming also afforded African-American players with a chance to prove their merits against their white counterparts, despite organized baseball's gentlemen's agreement, allowing stars like Pete Hill, Andrew Rube Foster, Smokey Joe Williams, and John Henry Pop Lloyd to show that they could hold their own against the best white players. In 1911, a white St. Louis journalist named Clark McAdams wrote, there is some doubt if baseball after all is the great American game. We play it to be sure, but the colored people play it so much better that the time is apparently coming when it shall be known as the great African game. It requires some courage to predict that colored baseball, like colored pugilism, is to supersede the white brand, 
Someone has to think ahead and indicate whither we drift. And we therefore go on record as having said that it will. The first two decades of the 20th century saw a number of open their doors to African Americans. Circuits such as the Florida Hotel League, popularly known as the Coconut League, the California Winter League, and the Cuban League allowed many barnstormers to make baseball virtually a year-round livelihood. The participation of players from the two major leagues in several of these leagues gave African Americans additional opportunities to demonstrate that race alone was keeping them from competing at the highest level of the sport. Entertainment was often a prominent component of barnstorming, especially when the home side was hopelessly overmatched and the game itself held no suspense and little inherent interest. As such, traveling teams tried to find ways to give the spectators something to laugh at or to marvel at, leaving them eager to return for the next game. Such efforts required delicacy, however, because the last thing a barnstorming team wanted was to embarrass their hosts. Clowning by African-American ballplayers was especially problematic. Every member of a black barnstorming team, reported Saul White, would do a funny stunt during a game back in the 80s and early 90s. Some participants considered these shenanigans to be harmless fun, while others were resigned to view them as unavoidable. But many African-American clubs were disturbed that these exhibitions played into the same demeaning racial stereotypes as minstrel shows. So instead, they sought other means of amusing a bored crowd or just tried to provide what one reporter's account described as a sort of get spirit, which carries the spectators back a good many years in ball playing. In addition, clowning led many observers to imagine that African-American players did not take the game as seriously or put as much effort into mastering their craft as did their white counterparts. Such suppositions were profoundly disturbing to men like Rube Foster, a native of Texas, and like the Walker brothers, a minister's son. In a three-decade career that began in 1897, Foster established himself both as one of the best pitchers and as one of the best managers of the era, black or white. Foster was also able to reap the financial rewards of his skill in the pitching box, often garnering almost year-round paychecks by joining a winter league team after a summer of crisscrossing the United States. The remuneration increased after he formed the Chicago American Giants in 1911 and began a 15-year tenure as the manager of one of black baseball's greatest teams, during which he made the transition from player manager to bench manager. Yet with each passing year, Rube Foster's ambitions gradually shifted from individual success to a vision of African Americans giving up barnstorming and putting down permanent roots. The fatigue of constant travel and the opportunity for fans to cheer on their home team both contributed to Foster's dream. What really drove him, however, was the conviction that barnstorming African Americans would never receive their due as ballplayers because their successes would be perceived as the result of innate natural ability, not of hard work and dedication to refining those skills. I doubt if any race playing the game studies it more closely, he wrote in 1910. The Negro in the past few years has advanced from the barnyard class of team up to aggregations that many big league managers would be glad to annex to their strength. But as Foster went on to explain, that reality was not receiving a great amount of attention because the best we can do is to mingle with the semi-pros. And the supposition is that all such class of teams are only copying after the big fellows. And as long as African-American baseball was synonymous with barnstorming, he insisted, the fatigue from the constant travel and the inevitability of exhibiting on diamonds that resemble the proverbial cornfields would continue to provide justification for denying them places in the white professional leagues. This reasoning led Foster to conclude that African Americans would receive that long overdue opportunity 
only if they formed their own league. And he was willing to sacrifice to make that possible. According to Dave Malarcher, Foster's protege and eventual successor as manager of the American Giants, Rube had had an opportunity to leave Negro baseball and to go into white semi-pro baseball because he was the leading drawing card outside of the major leagues back in those days when he was pitching. But Rube told me he refused to go because he knew that all he had to do was to keep it up to a high standard and the time would come when the white leagues would have to admit us. The thing for us to do, he said, was to keep on developing so that when that time did come, we would be able to measure up. Hopes of forming such a league, however, continued to be stymied by a number of factors, including the ongoing feuds between Foster and such rival owners as C.I. Taylor of the Indianapolis ABCs and Ed Bolden of the Hilldale Club, a black ball club from just west of Philadelphia. The ill will raise the larger question of whether men with a drive and competitive fire to build powerhouse teams would be able to set aside their differences in order to forge a stable and successful league. Agreeing to join a league would also represent a significant financial sacrifice for Foster as the operator of a successful barnstorming team. Although launching such a team was no easy matter, once the initial challenges had been overcome, success built upon itself by making it much easier to schedule lucrative games and attract top talent. By contrast, there was no guarantee that a league of African-American players would be financially viable. Although white fans often attended interracial games in sizable numbers, they could not be counted on to do so when there were no white faces on the playing field. This necessitated reliance upon the support of African Americans, a population that had less disposable income and had historically been concentrated in the rural South. By the turn of the century, African Americans had begun moving to the cities and to the North, but new issues emerged. In the East, there was the daunting problem that Sunday baseball was prohibited in many of the largest cities. The Midwest appeared somewhat more promising, but all too often northward migration created population clusters that made competitive balance elusive. Ira Lewis, a black sports writer for the Pittsburgh Courier, one of the leading African-American newspapers, observed with two Stonewall teams in Chicago and Indianapolis and mediocre outfits in Dayton, St. Louis and other cities, Colored baseball certainly presented a top-heavy aspect. Another attempt to form a professional league of African-American baseball teams was made in 1919, only to soon fizzle out. But by then, significant changes were underway that yielded a far greater prospect of success. First, half a million African-Americans relocated to the North between 1916 and 1919 in what became known as the Great African American Migration, almost overnight creating viable markets in the industrialized cities of the Great Lakes region. Cleveland's African American population quadrupled between 1910 and 1920, while that of Detroit swelled by over 600%. Second, World War I finally came to an end in 1918, and in the relief and exhilaration that followed, Americans flocked to ballparks in 1919. And last, but by no means least, Rube Foster continued to be driven by his vision of a professional league that African Americans could embrace as their own. With all these factors converging, the Negro National League was organized at a meeting in Kansas City on February 13, 1920. And when the teams took the field that spring, it was apparent how much thought and effort had been put into making the new venture work. With entrants representing the Midwestern cities of Chicago, Detroit, Kansas City, St. Louis, Indianapolis, and Dayton, a season-long schedule of games was possible without pouring all the receipts into the coffers of the railroads. Foster and other owners received press accolades for transferring some of their better players to their weaker rivals 
with the aim of equalizing the playing strengths. And although Foster's Chicago American Giants claimed the league's first three pennants, in each of those seasons, the competition was stiff. The Negro National League was the first of the leagues that are now collectively referred to as the Negro Leagues, which became one of the largest industries to be predominantly owned and operated by African Americans. Even more importantly, the Negro Leagues became a powerful symbol of the indomitable spirit that had impelled the migration of a long oppressed people. As Elaine Locke, the first African American Rhodes Scholar and one of the leading lights of the Harlem Renaissance put it, the tide of Negro migration northward and cityward is to be explained primarily in terms of a new vision of opportunity, of social and economic freedom, of a spirit to seize a chance for the improvement of conditions. With each successive wave of it, the movement of the Negro becomes more and more a mass movement toward the larger and the more democratic chance. A deliberate flight, not only from countryside to city, but from medieval America to modern. An especially potent manifestation of that new vision of opportunity entered the world one year before the formation of the Negro National League. Jackie Robinson was born to impoverished African-American sharecroppers in rural Georgia on January 31st, 1919. 16 months later, in the same month that the Negro National League took the field for the first time, the Robinson family boarded the number 58 train for a new life in Pasadena, California. By no means was California a beacon of racial harmony during the 1920s and 30s, but Jackie Robinson was able to take advantage of its more tolerant climate to star in four sports at UCLA, paving the way for him to shatter baseball's color barrier. All right. <laughs> Let me get on to the next part in our stream here. Let me get my computer screen adjusted here. All right, there we go. Okay. Let me uh, get everything set up for our next part here. Make some minor adjustments. I got to take care of this real quick here on the sticky. That's the first that we're in the live stream. Uh, that was a good one. Thank you for sharing. No problem. <laughs> Bibby says, enjoyed that. California is all inclusive nowadays. <laughs> uh, no, uh, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't making a. What, what did John say earlier? Are you making balloon animals? No, I was writing uh, a little bit of information on this box right here. This will be for Saturday's sale. I do have a. Uh, I have my own set, but I do have a second set here. And I'm pretty close to making another set, which might be for my next sale in January. But this set will be for sale uh, on Saturday. This uh, Cal Ripken Jr. Uh, Tops X Cal Ripken Jr. It's a special a special 50 card set that uh, Tops did. Um, <clears throat> I did get two of them, but I'm going to sell one of these in my sale on Saturday, if anybody's a Cal Ripken Jr. collector out there. And these will be available on my sale on Saturday, along with everything else I'm getting together. I'll go through in my sale on Saturday just to give you a preview. Um, some of the things that did not sell last month, and then I do have a lot of new stuff for this month that we'll highlight and go through first. And so I will have, uh, it could, we'll see how long the sale goes for on Saturday. But we will start at 10 a.m. on Saturday, just so everybody knows. Did you ever see the conspiracy an Orioles player turned the power off at Camden Yards because uh, Cal was hurt? <laughs> Sorry, Orioles, Orioles employees. <laughs> to continue his streak. <laughs> I don't know about that one. Nice conspiracy thought, though. <laughs> 
But um, so here's what we're going to do here. I'm going to add these names in here. F.J. DeCon got three entries. John Fishman got three entries. And Bibby Bobka got th two entries. That was all my live chatting that took place at 1030 sharp when I went live on the channel. So let me uh, do this real quick here. Get the chat up to date here. Um, dun, dun, dun. Get that caught up. I think that was way behind. There we go. I think we're good to go there. So let me get the names added into the Wheel of Names for the month of December's drawing. Okay. So, um... Get down here real quick. All right, we got FJ DeKong or DeKing. <laughs> All right, and then I got three for John Fishman. Bibby Bobkas. Oh. Sorry, bear with me. Get all these typed in here. Huh. Okay. So we are good to go there. Uh, he caught Kevin Costner with his what? I'd say da -da -da, a light lightning malfunction he caught kevin costner with his wife and beat him up that's the rumor <laughs> oh my word john okay so let me get this saved real quick and then we will get into our content at hand here okay so that's a sneak peek um and if anybody has any requests for some things you'd like me to bring up in our sale for Saturday as far as uh, if you want me to try and look for some players no guarantee if I can find them or not um, <laughs> okay no <laughs> I'm not saying it didn't happen but uh, interesting facts yeah, I'm telling you, John, you got to do you got to do videos and and that's what you need to make your channel all about. You know, just like Left Behind Times, he goes and explores uh, buildings in the middle of the night. <laughs> kind of like creepy, crawly type stuff. But it's uh, kind of interesting the way he does his videos. I really appreciate and the content that he creates on his channel. Um, that's what each individual has to do on their own channels is... Find something that they enjoy doing. That's why I do the baseball. That's why I do a lot of the history of baseball. Uh, baseball oddities by Fishman. Well, it doesn't even it doesn't even have to be baseball related. What you know, it could be there, John. Uh, just like Bibby said, baseball oddities by Fishman. That sounds like an awesome channel name. But uh, everybody has to find their own niche and what they're comfortable in doing on their channel. That's why they call me sometimes the Mr. Rogers of baseball card channels. Um, and that's fine because I do a lot of the history of baseball and enjoy doing that. Along with sharing the baseball cards themselves. Uh, but you need to also, in your love of your hobby, do what you like to do and what you want to present to the people. But uh, the government might ask me, add me to a list if I dig too deep on videos. Well, that's, 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 that's something that people do um, in their endeavors, of course. But I don't know about adding you to a list. Uh, 
Trust me, I'm probably added on somebody's list somewhere because I read the Bible on my channel. <laughs> I'm sure they're watching me to make sure I don't post something that goes off the deep end. But you, you just never know. You just got to find something that works for you. And in regards there, Bibby, to your question earlier, yes, this box did have your address on the back, but I kind of took care of that. I kind of took care of it on this one. I don't mind that people see this address. This is my business address. But whenever you do get something from me in the mail, if we are in a uh, two-way type conversation and stuff, like I've become with Bibby Her, um, you can always send to my home address. Uh, if you do deep searching in my videos, you'll see once or twice where I've shown my home address. But that is fine also. But um, that's why I do use a, a business address until I get to know a person on a personal level. So, but that is box number five here from Bibby. Okay, you can see Bibby Bobka there, and that's my address um, where my business mail goes. And then so, and there's nothing. And I checked the other two boxes, number six and number seven there, Bibby, and we are good to go there. You didn't... It looked like it was probably these two boxes, yesterday's box and then today's box, that has uh, some of that information in there. But without further ado, um, my wife is out and about taking care of things. And I told her today's video will not be too long because, remember, my wife is on vacation this week from her work. And uh, we get to go clean our church. This, this is our turn to clean our church this week. So we are going to head there when I finish with my stream today. So I'm going to kind of take all these out of the packages here. Oh, we got some USA baseball cards in here, I saw. But um, we're just going to kind of go through things here. And uh, we'll just play this one pack at a time. Let me go ahead and... Oh, okay, yeah, I see these. These do have, this does have some tape on it. So let me, uh, although he did seal it. Okay, we got that. Uh, that's okay that those are taped there. I'm just going to open up the top since I do know how to open a flat rate. Okay, this one has a note in it. <laughs> this one has a note in it. Is it okay? Let me look at the note real quick. Uh, oh, this says, this is package one of 12. One package will be sent. Oh, my word. Really, baby? This is, wow, well, November 9th. The Elodon Bibby Bobka hopes you enjoy these cards. This uh, this package is this is package one of twelve. Wow, one package will be sent monthly. Thanks for all you do. Oh wow, this is awesome, there, Bibby. I wish it would have been packaged. Oh, this is, oh, never mind. This is box, oh my word, this is box, this is only the first box of 12. This is like the 12 months of Christmas. Is that what you're talking about there, Bibby? So I'm going to be going through these boxes until next, oh my word. <laughs> Good thing, uh, wow. Yeah, so I should be finished this. Um, wow. This is, uh. <laughs> I'm speechless on this one. Um, definitely got to throw this note. I am going to be... I'm going to have to get something together for you, baby. I'm going to send you something special. I am going to send you something special. I should have waited now on something else here. Wow, baby. <laughs> he says, the gift that keeps giving... I, I guess you could say that again, the gift that keeps giving. I'm just speechless now. Um, I don't know what to say on this one. Wow. Well, here's another bundle of cards here. 
And another bundle of cards here. Oh my word, is this? Oh, there's something else in here too. Uh oh. And it looks like we've got some some bonus here. We'll see what that is when we get to that. Make sure it looks like it's just bubble wrap in here now. Oh my word. The gift that keeps giving, huh, baby? Oh my word. What am I gonna do? I guess I'll have fun going through these boxes. Okay, come on. Good things are these good thing these are all penny sleeved, that's for sure. <laughs> oh my word. Two thousand one archives, Ozzy Smith. My word, baby. Let me throw that in there to get this next one opened up here. Mm. I'm going to have fun sorting all these cards if you're going to send me all this stuff. Uh, okay, so nothing but packing material left in here. Let me set this off to the to the back of me here. Put that in there. Let me put my cutting device away. I'll open up that whatever's in that cardboard there last. Oh boy, Bibby. A bonus. <laughs> this one's a bonus, huh? I'll do that last. We'll see what's in this right here. So let me just kind of separate some of these things out. Oh no, some oh some gold border cards. Uh oh, is that oh that's like part of the Nolan Ryan set. Felix Hernandez, Nolan Ryan. That's nice because I've got I've I've got um the complete set of this Nolan Ryan group here. I think the series one and series two, I think they did it in two parts. Those so these will be extra ones for sure for my uh wow. This is amazing, all these cards. Definitely going to fill up my Hall of Fame bin, aren't you? <laughs> I'm going to probably... By the time these 12 months are done, I'll probably be doubling my, uh, <laughs> my Hall of Fame collection here. Oh, my word. So, uh, Bob Gibson with the St. Louis Cardinals. This looks like some more of the uh, 2002 flair. This is a 2002 Flair product. I think it says uh, Fall Fall Classic, maybe. Uh, Christy Mathewson with the Giants. Steve Carlton with the Philadelphia Phillies. I'll say that every once in a blue moon when I'm doing thinking uh, from the good old days. When I was growing up as a kid, I used to watch. I used to be a big fan of the Philadelphia Phillies back in the day. Uh, Dave Parker with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Goose Goslin with the Washington Senators. Roger Maris with the New York Yankees. Uh, Johnny Padres with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Gary Carter with the New York Mets. Kirk Gibson with the Dodgers. Eddie Matthews with the Braves. Johnny Mize with the Yankees. Keith Hernandez with the Mets. Uh, Brooks Robinson with the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Jimmy Fox with the Philadelphia Athletics. Oh, sorry, that's just me. <laughs> I'll flip that one over. <laughs> Uh, Roger Hornsby with the Cardinals. Mordecai Brown with the Cubs. Joe Carter with the Blue Jays. I think what they do is the more the more contemporary players are in color and the older players are in black and white, mainly because they probably didn't have a lot of color photography back in the day. 
laugh out loud. You did that on purpose? For Rogers Hornsby? <laughs> Joe Carter with the Blue Jays. Wade Boggs with the Red Sox. Dave Winfield with the Blue Jays. Frankie Frisch with the Cardinals. Robin Yount with the Milwaukee Brewers. Jerry Coleman with the New York Yankees. Fred Lynn with the Boston Red Sox. Frank Baker with the Philadelphia Athletics. Cy Young with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Chief Bender with the Philadelphia Athletics. Chief Bender. I should do a biography on him. Uh, Duke Snyder with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Carlton Fisk with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, Lefty Grove with the Philadelphia Athletics. And Ty Cobb with the Detroit Tigers. Oh, my word, we got some bonus. Oh, wow, look at this, some bonus relics. Some relics lit in here. Uh, Logan Allen. Logan Allen, College National Team. And Colby Halter. Are these from this year? 2020 Panini. Wow. 2020 ben Panini. That's an oddity. I'm not a big U.S. I did collect uh, this year's set of the base cards. Um, for I gotta remember where I put those. <laughs> They're somewhere in my room here. But I did go uh, through these. That's kind of interesting. I guess. When you do get material, you might get something with a crease in it. It almost feels like there's something underneath the patch there. Don't know for sure. But that is awesome, Bibby. Um, okay. Let's go through here now. We got uh, Ozzy Smith. Uh, 2001 Archives. All right. Oh, it looks like, oh, some 2001 art. Preacher Row? Is that Preacher Row? <laughs> oh, boy. I remember when I first started my channel and stuff, I did a, a video that had a lot of older cards in it and stuff. And I remember talking a little bit about Preacher Row. Uh, but Joe Adcock, Cleveland Indians. Preacher Row with the Dodgers. These are all some 2001 archives cards here. Uh, Willie Stargell with the Pirates. Harvey Kuhn with the Tigers. Uh, Ron Guidry with the Yankees. Uh, 1976 rookie pitchers. Hoyt Wilhelm with the Dodgers. Uh, Kirk Gibson with the Tigers. Maury Wills with the Dodgers. Gaylord Perry with the Mariners. With the Seattle Mariners. And yes, this is an odd. Uh, I do have a shirt that has Gaylord, uh, not the one I'm wearing today. It's a Hall of my Hall of my Seattle Mariners Hall of Fame shirt has Gaylord Perry listed on there as a Seattle Mariner Hall of Famer, and that's why he got put in as a he was a pitcher, but then I think he became a manager too. Jack Morris, rookie pitchers, 1978. Gary Carter, 2001 Archives for Gary Carter. Sparky Anderson. Sparky Anderson? I think that's this uh, 71 Tops, I think. I only remember that because I've got that in my 50 Years of Baseball. Uh, 50 Years of Baseball. Bum, bum, bum. Silver Packs. My Mystery Silver Packs, which are starting to sell like hotcakes on, on eBay. Gonna have to make some more up if I sell out before Christmas. They are turning out to be a hot selling product right now, which is good for me. I'm starting to make a little bit of money. Uh, sorry, I hit the camera there. Sparky Anderson, Don Larson with the Houston Astros, Ralph Kiner with the Pittsburgh Pirates, uh, Lou Whitaker with the Tigers, uh, Orioles, Earl Weaver with the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, early win. Early win. All right. And then we got who? What have we got there? Walter Alston with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, Mickey Vernon with the Washington Senators. All right. Then we've got uh, 1964 
rookie stars Indians, Tommy John. Tommy John, pitcher. Robin Roberts with the Astros. Nellie Fox with the Astros. Uh, Craig Nettles, rookie stars with the Twins. Gary Matthews, San Francisco Giants. Uh, Kurt Flood. Kurt Flood with the Senators. So awesome, awesome. Uh, 2001 Archives uh, cards there. Thank you there, baby. Appreciate those. Let me move down through this next set here. It looks like maybe some Diamond Kings. Carl Ferrillo with Brooklyn. Billy Williams with Chicago. Leo DeRocher with Brooklyn. Harry Hooper with Boston. Goose Goslin with um, the Washington Senators. Pretty sure it was the Senators back in the day. Uh, Earl Avaro with, the Cle with Cleveland. S Jim Bottomley with St. Louis. Oh, there we go. There's a Fairfield, a early Fer Fairfield Friday there with Jim Bottomley. <laughs> uh, Harry Walker with St. Louis. Uh, Gabby Harnett with Chicago. Carl Ferrillo, Fer Ferrillo with Brooklyn. Heine Grow with Cincinnati. Nellie Fox with Chicago. Paul Weiner with Pittsburgh. Ted Lyons with Chicago. Luke Appling with Chicago. Joe Cronin with Boston. Kirby Puckett with Minnesota. John McGraw with, the, <laughs> with New York with his famous stance there. Andy Pettit with, the, with New York. Al Oliver with Pittsburgh. Chuck Klein with Philadelphia. Herb Pencock with New York. And Billy Herman. So some awesome Diamond Kings from uh, 2017 Panini. All right. Now let's move on to this last stack here. Looks like first here we got a few a few stray uh, Cooperstown cards from Robin Yelp, Raleigh Fingers, and Paul Molitor from 1992-1999 uh, and 2004. Let's see. Let me move these up just a hair so I get a little bit more space. I think my wife's coming home right now. I heard the garage opening. So let me set these right here. Uh, let me through, go through this this gold set here. Uh, Ruby Marquad. Uh, this is uh, SP Legendary Cuts from... It looks like... Uh, sorry. Another 2001 set. Mm -mm. Okay, there we go. Just some upside down cards here. <laughs> All right, so Ruby Marquad, Carlton Fisk, Burley Grimes, Earl Averell. Tony Oliva, Walter Alston, Bob Feller, and Minnie Minosa. Minnie Minosa. All right, set those right there. Hopefully I can, oops, sorry. Just making sure you can see the different stacks on the camera. I can probably move those right there. This one right here. Hold on, let me. Uh, oh, not my wife. It's my daughter. I can hear her in her room next door. Her. All right. Let me go through this next little grouping here. Some gypsy queens in here. Oh my word! The living legend. Oh, they must have did a Pete Rose set. Sorry, I'm just going to separate some of these out into different groupings here. I never knew they made a Pete Rose set like this one. Oh, my word. Wow. I'll have to check this one out. 
Okay. So, of course, we got a Felix Hernandez here with the Seattle Mariners. And then we've got a uh, Nolan Ryan at age 20, all state pitcher. Uh, Nolan Ryan, seven no hitters. Nolan Ryan, Jacksonville Suns. Again, this is, I believe it's a, I think it's a 300 card set, or maybe it's a 250 card set. I've got the complete set of this Nolan Ryan, uh, I think it's the Nolan Ryan Express cards. That's four out of that set there. That is pretty cool. Then we've got some Gypsy Queens here. Some Gypsy Queens. Uh, Dustin Pedroia with the Red Sox. Uh, Andre Dawson with the Cubs. Uh, Roy Holiday with the Phillies. Uh, Orlando Cepeda with the Giants. Ralph Kiner with the Pirates. Uh, let's see, Jay Fox, Jimmy Fox. Thought that's who that was with the Athletics. Uh, Joe Morgan with the Reds. And Andre Dawson with the Expos. These are probably different years, I think. 2011, 13, 11, 12, 12, 13, 12. So 2011, 12, and 13 Gypsy Queens right there. Actually, I should put these a little bit closer here. Don't mind me. I'm just trying to keep them on display here on the table. And let's go through this little... Um, I don't know how many of these I got in here. Looks like I see some 40s. Might have been a... a I'm guessing it might have been a 50-card set. Sometimes when they do these tribute or maybe a third... 30 or 40, no, 43 is probably a 50 card set. There's card number 50. It was probably a 50 card set. I did not know they made this. But now I know. The Living Legend, Pete Rose. Of course, that's all it says on the front, but you got different pictures and photos of uh, Pete Rose there. That's a lot of cards for my Pete Rose collection, that's for sure. All right, Pete Rose. You know what card? Is that Pete Rose's son, probably? Oh, looking at the newspaper, probably checking the stats out. <laughs> These, this, there we go. That's the Pete Rose I remember seeing, <laughs> not the younger one, but uh. think that must be his son awesome 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 and then on the back you can see it talks about the different part card it does have little little burbs and write-ups on the backs of the cards but you can see them it looks like this photo is the same on the back the living legend pete rose and then it talks about it um this would be a nice set to, to do a little pete rose history on I'd have to see how how many of the, the cards I've got in this set. Another operation for sure. Uh, notice the year on Ryan. Oh, the year on Ryan. Are you talking about these Nolan Ryans? Yeah, ni 1991. And uh, Pacific Trading Cards was right up here where uh, I live. I know where their their office is based out of. And that's uh, Linwood, Washington. They were there until a while ago. I don't think they've even got the building there anymore, to the best of my knowledge, unless they moved. Is that what you're talking about there? Notice the year on the Ryans? 1991.
This set was authorized for him. Yeah, Linwood. Linwood, Washington. That's what I thought there. Yep, I am very familiar with that baseball card company that was around for a short time. Yes, Bibby. Okay, now I got to check this one here out. I want to check this one here out. I don't know if I should just open it on the bottom here. Oh, these look like they're oversized cards. Oh, my word. Oh. Bibby, have you been... Let's see. Make sure I don't miss anything else in there. Oh, my word. These are... Are these like first... This is first first day of issue. So this is uh, uh, Eddie Collins' base... Uh, a postage stamp. Oh, wow. And a Cy Young postage stamp. And, uh, oh, McGuire. It's got to be McGuire and Sosa. <laughs> oh, my word, Bibby. It says, don't get, let's see, don't get too far ahead of me. Sammy Sosa joked with McGuire after number 61. So these are postmarked in uh, Houston, Texas, September 25th, 1998, and St. Louis, Missouri, September 27th, 1998. Wow. These are awesome there, Bibby. Eddie Collins, 1887, 1951. Eddie Collins was one of the most mysterious rookies in baseball history. He was a successful football quarterback before playing baseball. He was vice president of the Boston Red Sox from 1933 to his death in 1951. These are awesome, baby. First day of... <laughs> this would go into a a deluge of uh, my other hobbies. <laughs> uh, postage stamps, coin collecting. Uh, I've been accused of being a collector of, of things. <laughs> hand-painted first day covers. Oh, these are hand-painted first day covers at that. Oh, my word, this one is... Oh, wow, I didn't even notice that. Is that the same one with this one here? Um, let's see, that one. Wow. So, yeah, th this Eddie, Eddie Collins here is a Dynamite Covers 1 of 80. Is this the first one of 80, Bibby? My word. Only 80 of these exist out there. Hand-painted first day covers. And then this one's the first day of issue. Cy Young Baseball Legends. My word. So back in the day in 2000, postage stamps were only 33 cents. Of course, now we're up to 50, which, believe it or not, is not that much of a big price increase. But uh, first day of issue, July 6th, 2000. My word. 100th All Century Team. So this is kind of, I guess, part of a, a, a little set here. That, that Definitely the postage stamps because it's the, the 33 cent baseball, baseball set. That was totally awesome there, Bibby. I'm going to just put that in front of there for now. My, my word. The first one on that Eddie Collins. Wow. I don't know what to say on that one. I am speechless. I am speechless. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. I got to find some place to store these now. <laughs> Well, I do have I do have a binder 
it for. It might fit in the binder I have in the pages for now until I can find a better home for them. I have a binder where I put my Hall of Fame cards. So we have uh, Cy Young there. And we have Eddie Collins. Then we have, well, of course, Sosa and Maguire won't be Hall of Famers, but they are they're notable players to talk about in baseball history, that's for sure. But these will go in my Hall of Fame binder for my Hall of Fame postcards. I might even put it together um, where I put um, each, each slot with their Hall of Fame uh, their Hall of Fame plaques, the postcards, the Hall of Fame postcard set that I have. Man, I just got to figure out a place to put them. But these are awesome cards. And I've got two more boxes to do. We'll do uh, the next round of boxes tomorrow. Um, we'll see. Probably, uh, probably what I might do is to finish up this box. Um, to finish up this box in short order in case something new comes in soon um is uh i might open up bibby's box number seven on saturday just prior to the sale but we'll kind of see what we do for sure on that one but uh well i am just like uh totally speechless now and this is going to be the 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 12 12 months of Christmas? Is that what you called it earlier? I remember you said in one stream, and maybe I, I wasn't paying attention and didn't read it right. But wow. So this is box one of 12. Oh, my word, baby. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If I ever make it to uh, to your neck of the woods out there in that part of the country, I will surely try to uh, see if I can figure out how to uh, come and have a chance to meet you um, in Georgia. How far How far are you from Atlanta? Just kind of curious. How far are you from Atlanta there, Bibby? Oh, wow. Well. Because I do, I do head out to Pensacola sometimes. That's where my Pensacola, Florida, is where my son lives. He has a house there, so we do come out that neck of the woods. Okay, ten minutes from Atlanta, so I'm trying to think. I think uh, Atlanta is only a couple couple hours from what I gather. I could be wrong. How do you know roughly how close how close you are to Pensacola, Florida? Is it a couple hour drive? And are you? The south side of Atlanta or the north side of Atlanta or the east or the west? <laughs> Just trying to narrow things down. But sometimes we do fly in through Atlanta going into Pensacola because Pensacola doesn't have a big airport. So what takes place is you're south of Atlanta. Okay. Okay. Ten minutes south of Atlanta. So that would put you a little bit closer to Pensacola. So uh, you could meet me too. Laugh out loud, <laughs> Bibby. I'm in Marietta. <laughs> oh, that's right. I can go out there and, and we could have a, a meet and greet with Left Behind Times and Bibby at the same time. Pretty close. <laughs> you guys live in the same general vicinity. <laughs> so if I ever did plan a trip out there, we'd have to uh, have to get together with Left Behind. Left Behind Times. Look at that. Left Behind Time's been lurking in the background. He's probably been... He, he, you've been start, sorting your cards there, Left Behind? <laughs> All right. So we do have a few minutes left here. I'm going to go ahead and get ready to close up our stream today. Um, just so you do know, I did figure out how to schedule a stream on YouTube. So I know how to do that. I, I didn't realize there was a more settings before you go live. And you can actually schedule on youtube so as much as this makes it easier in some aspects i'm trying to see down the road i still have to check one more thing because my stream labs is not working but i think i might know what i 
what I did in error. I got to check my Streamlabs from my iMac and the Streamlabs that I have on my phone. I think I, for some reason, I have two different logins. So, uh, that's what I have to do there. So, other than that, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera around, say my signature goodbye, and get ready to wrap things up for today. But, Bibby, I appreciate all these cards. And this here is uh, something I will cherish, that's for sure. Legends of Baseball, first day of issue. Um, so that was probably in 2000 when they came out with the baseball card stamps. Or baseball card. The baseball player stamps. Uh, Let Pine Times, I had a store in Mayrata. Discount warehouse back in 1991 to 2000. And promoted a show in Kennesaw, Georgia. And promoted show in Kensaw. Is that, is that how you say that? Kensaw, Georgia? <laughs> you Georgia people there. You talk with a draw. <laughs> I could throw a little draw in there. But I, I'm not that no expert in the, in the southern draw. Unless I really want to talk that way. <laughs> Sorry. Don't mean, don't, don't take it wrong. <laughs> Very cool. Yep, that's my stomping grounds. <laughs> All right. Well, Bibby, you got to check out Left Behind's videos that he does of different play, different places on his channel if you get a chance. I don't know if you checked them out already or not, but Left Behind Times is a awesome uh, creator. Let's just say that. Let me move these over here. All right. No draw, please. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> no problem. I'll just talk normal. Oh, you posted a new one. I got to check out your new video then, Blake. I got to check out your new, uh, your new video. So let me turn the camera around. Let me back up my chair first. Get into position here. And then turn my camera around. All right. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the, the show today. There was a little, there was something on my screen. I had, to, I had to blow the dust off. But um, hopefully you all enjoyed it today. Hopefully we'll have fun. We'll look forward to uh, my next Hall of Famer, which I'll do tomorrow. What was scheduled to be Roberto Alomar, but I already did his. So I added him into the playlist as episode number three. So episode number four tomorrow will be Walter Alston. Walter Alston will be the biography we'll do tomorrow for our episode four. You'll think, how'd you skip from two to four? Because I already I looked on my player biography list, and if I've done the player biography already, I'll incorporate incorporate that into uh, my stream or into my playlist for the Hall of Fame player biographies. Because I'm going to get one where eventually we'll have everything from A through Y course uh henry aaron is the first one and robin yelp is the last one in alphabetical order by last name so with that in mind uh happy festivus <laughs> john fishman says happy festivus um so this has been donald blomdahl hall of fame veteran sports cards and collectibles having been live to you from arlington washington with our latest installment on the channel so hopefully you all enjoyed it. Uh, Festivus for the rest of us. <laughs> I can always count on ja, John and Bibby Bobka to keep some humor in the channel. But um, do appreciate everybody. Appreciate Bibby for uh, the package you sent me. It's just blowing my socks off. And I can't wait to see what's in the last two sets here. Um, I'm just, it's, you're blowing me away here. I would have never thought I would have got some of these cards that you've sent me. But uh, I appreciate you, Bibby. Appreciate everything uh, that you've done. I'm sure, I, I'm, I hope when you had your successful time, uh, so you, you had a card shop for about, uh, was it about nine years? Did it just uh, 
the kind of business just slow down? Is that what took place? Is that why maybe think uh, Cynthia is going to tell the United States Postal Sh Service not to ship Donald any more cards? Yeah, especially if I've got 11 more boxes of cards coming in. My wife's, I keep telling my wife, okay, I made some more sales. She said, good, sell it all. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm trying to, at least all the stuff that I don't PC. <laughs> So, um, but yeah, we do have fun in the channel. That's, that's what it's all about. So I, I do like this. I see here I've got, uh, on my phone, I've got seven, seven people watching, seven thumbs up on my computer. I've got, uh, seven people watching, eight thumbs up. Um, so I do appreciate everybody that's been here this morning. We didn't get up the double digits, but that's fine. Um, oh, you had five different shops over the last 40 years. Oh, do you still have a baseball card shop there, Bibby? Do you still have a baseball card shop? Or do you have some? They're probably more popular out there. Uh, I wish I had the funding and the know-how. I would like... Oh, you're retired now. Okay. You're retired now. I don't blame you. So you're pretty close to about my age there, Bibby? <laughs> For any that have been following me, I, I'm 62... My wife's going to be 65 soon. Don't tell her I said that. Um, but she'll be turning 65 this month. She had to switch over to Medicare. Um, 10 fewer. You're in your 50s? <laughs> 10 fewer. Uh, so, other than that, I'm going to go ahead and get ready to sign off. We will see you guys tomorrow morning. 10.30 a.m. I'll get on probably about 10.15. I'll pop on early tomorrow if everything's going well. And we will see you all tomorrow. Just a little note, uh, two, two, two side notes before I do sign off. If you do get a chance, go ahead and check out Boom Slang. Um, if you do, uh, you'll come up with different Boom Slangs if you just search Boom Slang as one word. But put when you search for them, do it Boom Slang baseball cards and then you'll see his channel come up he does a lot of sorting of baseball cards he's got about 130 subscribers to go to reach his thousand subscriber mark and i told him i would try to uh help him out with that and then also at uh later this afternoon for those on the west coast and uh, those on the east coast ethan's elvis covers and more is going to have his baseball card sale so go ahead and check him out when you get a chance. And um, other than that, don't forget, I'll give another friendly reminder here of uh, Saturday. Don't forget uh, me. <laughs> don't forget me. Don't forget my huge Christmas sale this Saturday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Hopefully you all enjoy hopping on board and just checking out the different cards I'm trying to sell on my channel. So you all take care. Have a wonder, uh, Philadelphia. Philadelphia? Who's from Philadelphia? Phil Philadelphia. Yeah, it used Philadelphia used to be a nice city. Philadelphia until it became. It's supposed to be the city of brotherly love. That's what Philadelphia stands for. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's quite the city of brotherly love anymore. But until then, until tomorrow morning when we come live again to you, just remember you might see me around the channels somewhere. So take care. Lord bless you and have a great and wonderful day.